Yo, this hot, this the spot, there it is pod.com We're interviewing the best comedians, so tune in quick and get your ears receiving them We talking about life and life to stream right to you From the microphone right to your home, dude Side note, this might get embarrassing, but no, don't sweat, yo Cause there it is Welcome to the There It Is podcast, a comedy podcast to help you find your inspiration. I'm your host, Jason Farr. Let's do this. Great episode today. We have actor, comedian, musician, author, Dave Hill. What a great get for this podcast because he is hilarious, but he's also very unique and inventive. He's such a an original comedic voice. And I was so, so glad to get to talk to him and figure out what it is he does and how he does it. And he has some really great insight into his work, including how he makes his online videos, which I think is the perfect way to do it. I recently saw a recent guest, Anna Belange, and since she and I talked about making TikToks and Instagrams, I told her what Dave said about his approach, and her response was, that's brilliant. So it's not just me who thinks he has the right approach. You'll laugh, you'll learn, and you'll love Dave Hill. Here's my chat with Mr. Dave Hill. So I know you're from Cleveland, Ohio, and I know that you also, from my research, I found that you had a band in college, so you were doing music from a young age. You moved to New York in 2004-ish, so you start... 2003 and it was yeah. 2005 that you started performing live comedy. Yeah. And I I haven't seen anything from between doing music when you're in college to 2005 that mentions you doing anything with comedy. It's and so you started I guess around 30 is when you started doing comedy. Yeah, yeah, I didn't do I never planned to go into comedy. Oh, wow. Okay. It was sort of an accident. That explains the gap of not seeing information because it was sort of like Jesus. You know, you, there's you hear a little <laughs> bit when he's young and then there's this big gap. And then in his 30s, that's when you start hearing about. <laughs> I'm saying you're Christ-like in that way, Dave. I am in many ways. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I had. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't do any comedy at all until. Yeah, like I was writing. I started writing for first as a journalist Mm -hmm. in about 2000, I guess, or 1999 or whatever. And then from there, sort of gradually started realizing that I maybe wanted to write humorous things (laughs) of some sort. And so then I, I wound up writing for television. And then through that is how eventually... Well, I was writing for a TV show called Smoking Gun TV on Court TV, which is now, right. I think, True TV, maybe. Right, right. And, uh, and yeah, I saw that you were a correspondent on there. Yeah, and that was, I did that before I really did any live comedy. I was just, you know, I got hired as a writer. And and I, I by that point, I'd started making, like, stupid videos in my apartment. And so okay. I just kind of brought a copy of that to the uh to one of the writers meetings and through that I got hired to be correspondent and I did I don't know a couple segments I guess yeah maybe once so I can't remember so your in basically was having a journalism background yeah you know I, I was playing in bands and you know I started singing reluctantly and from that I ended up you know talking in between songs mm-hmm. and I liked doing that. And then, uh, in journalism, I realized I didn't really care at all about journalism. I just wanted to get a few jokes in to <laughs> a piece, you know, so I would write, you know, 750 words, 1500 words or whatever, and really not care about anything except for whatever jokes I tried to slip in, <laughs> I hope, you know, get past the editor without him ruining them or deleting (laughs) them so where did this love for comedy originate from i think just you know same as anyone just being like 
stupid with my friends and family, you know? I mean, that's still really all it is to me, you know? <laughs> I'm not even like a big, this is, this is a dangerous thing I'm about to say, but I'm not, I'm a fan of very specific comedy, like, but I'm not like a comedy nerd in that I don't uh -huh. devour everything that comes out. You know, there's stuff I love. There's always like, old stuff and new stuff that I love and performers that I love, but it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm watching everything on every comedy out, you know, like right. people will try to engage me. I'm like, Oh, have you watched this? I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is, there's plenty of greats, you know, I'm always finding stuff that I love, but I guess I, I really, like uh, very specific things. And it's sort of mm -hmm. like, you know, the, as a kid, you know, the things that I loved, I now in, in doing comedy, I kind of just want to be, do things that I think me and my buddies would have laughed at mm -hmm. in our basements when I, you know, when we were 15 or whatever. <laughs> so it's kind of my, my target audience is really just me and my friends when we were 15. <laughs> and, well, you know, uh, I, that's not, the first time I've heard someone say something like that, like Chevy Chase said when he was, when he first started out on SNL and was doing Weekend Update, he was just trying to make his friends at home laugh. <laughs> like he was kind of envisioning that he was looking through the camera at them in the living room and trying to make them laugh. And I, I think that helps to look at it that way. Yeah, I think so, you know, because it's really you just hope that there's other people like you and your friends out there right you know like i i've never i mean probably to a fault obviously i'm not like some huge superstar household name but i've never really cared about crowd pleasing or being likable or anything <laughs> like that i mean i want to be likable as a human being i want to be a good person <laughs> as best i can but in terms of performing i'm not too concerned about that what comes across, and I, I, we've seen you live and seen your stuff online, like on TikTok and Instagram, and your vibe when you're doing comedy very much comes across like this chilling with friends and just goofing around. Like that is the vibe of, of it all from the live stuff I've seen to, oh, thank you. Hey, it's Dave from before. And I think that makes it more accessible to, to oh, get into. You. Well, that's, you know, Thank you. I mean, that's that's kind of how I look at it, you know. It's just silliness and, you know, almost to a fault, I would say. I It's kind of, I'm so, want everything to be just like goofing around in the basement or at the dinner table, saying things I might say, hanging out. You know, I definitely admire people who are good at this, but I when people talk about just sort of like common, <laughs> relatable things and do a great job with it, I'm like, oh, man. I wish I could do that. I just don't, my brain just doesn't really work that way. Which is not me saying like, oh, everything I do is out is out there or whatever. But I'm just saying like, in a way, you know, I, I see people who are great about talking about, you know, having kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I don't have kids. So I guess I can't talk about that. I can talk about being an uncle. But yeah, I think the people that I really admired growing up were people like Bobcat Goldthwait and Chris Elliott and... Pee Wee Herman, you know, I realized those people were all like playing characters, but I always felt like when you're watching them, you're like, oh, this is what they would be doing or what their character would be doing at home alone, it seems like, you know. <laughs> I understood that they were doing characters, obviously, but I, I was like, this seems like they're not walking out and being like, hey, how are you? How is everybody doing, you know? So I, that's like what I've just kind of always been the biggest fan of is that that sort of yeah. stuff. You know, a lot of stuff, especially like doing Instagram and TikTok or whatever, is really comes out of just honestly trying to entertain myself. <laughs> yeah. And just get out of my head while I'm walking around or riding the bike. Or riding my bike. Yeah. Cause, you know, the bike stuff really happened during the pandemic. You know, my girlfriend and I coming back to Ohio and taking care of her mom. It was really coming from that of, of just being here. Well, the pandemic where everyone was isolated. Right. I was just going for these bike rides and I was 
just trying to entertain myself and imagining, you know, I was just imagining the people, I'd never see anybody, but I would just imagine these like <laughs> people in the town who wanted to fight me and stuff. <laughs> so it was just truly coming out of trying to entertain myself and, <laughs> you know, and then the other videos I, you know, when I'm not here, you know, when I'm just walking around New York or traveling wherever I am are just like, I'm usually alone, you know, walking, traveling, touring and stuff. And I'm just being an idiot by myself. Like, you know, I'll be like, I was just in Atlanta in this neighborhood. I didn't really know anything about. And I was just, I was like, well, I gotta go for a walk and just make stupid videos along the way. Just out of, like, cause I'm just bored, you know? So that's kind of what it comes out of just that sort of stuff. Yeah, I love that vibe. I wish there was more stuff like it, to be honest, just because I feel like so much is polished now to such a degree. It's almost like what I'm taking in isn't comedy. It's how polished it is. And I want some of the, I'm just goofing around here. <laughs> like, it's not that it's completely unpolished because you still have a way of presenting it that is aesthetically pleasing, but it's not overly rehearsed or overly concise it just works yeah and then it's also has a fun silly vibe to it thanks i mean it's fun i mean you know i wish i don't know sometimes i'm like oh man i wish i could figure out how to be, how to be more polished makes more <laughs> money i mean i'm doing fine i'm not complaining i mean i am complaining actually <laughs> i was just on the phone with my friend i was like i'm doing fine but i just want more <laughs> I guess everyone, most people, but well, unless that's everybody. Yeah. Even super rich people. I know there's no, unless you're like enlightened or well adjusted or whatever the thing is that makes you stop wanting to, you know, never be satisfied. But no, I, you know, what I do is like very rarely anything that would work in a four minute late. I've never done late night television, not bragging, very disappointed actually. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a ton of TV stuff, so it's kind of a surprise to hear that you haven't had a late night spot. Because you were on at midnight, you did a lot of spots like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of TV and some movie stuff, but I, you know, I haven't really. To be fair, it's not like I've really tried too hard to get a late night spot. Mm -hmm. I did have one. I, I won't say what show I was supposed to do, and then. Uh, Someone got fired and the new person was like, no. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, show business, cruel mistress. But, yeah. Whatever. You know, it's all okay. I mean, I'm you so know, I, I might, can fill a basement anywhere in the world, as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's plenty of people doing late night who can't do that. So, I guess I'll, I guess I'll take it. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you were in L.A., I think you definitely would have been on Conan. I, I don't see how you couldn't have gotten on there if you were in L.A. all the time. I'm, a, you know, I'm almost, it's almost impressive. I'm one of the few people that never did Conan. I did showcase once for it, and I think they thought, what, I don't know, they were like, mm, no. <laughs> well, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's, you're so funny, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and the song. So, you know, and I talk, it's not like, there's anything, so when I say that it's not overly polished, I'm not saying that it's sloppy because you think about the songs that you do, they, they, they follow structure well, they're on time. The, the playing is good. I, when, I didn't expect, when I first saw you, I didn't expect the, the guitar playing to be so good. Oh, thanks. It was pretty solid. Uh, yeah, I'm a beast. No, uh... <laughs> No, you know, I think um, it depends. Some nights I play better than others. It depends if I'm trying or not. <laughs> but uh, but I, you know, for a long time, I was sort of reluctant to play guitar in the context of comedy because everything I was seeing was like just bashing away at sort of G chords and things like that. And I was like, oh, it's not funny to be good. And then I was like, well what if I'm just really good? And then it became funny again. If once you're like my, my favorite compliment, cause I, I perform with, you know, I bands will have me do like a comedy set before they're, you know, like I do that a lot for, with bands where I'll 
do comedy, but then I'll play a little guitar during my set. And my mm -hmm. secretly, my goal is to always like uh, make all the guitar players that are on the show that night know that I'm the best. <laughs> and that's a, if, if if they admit it, I'm like, my job is done. If they admit, <laughs> damn it, the comedian's the best guitar player of the night. <laughs> Not that I'm the best, but you know, I'm all right. <laughs> I think this is what I picked up on watching you because there was obviously so much talent that was converging on itself because there's comedy and music and there there is they were both so solid. And then when I started seeing more stuff you were doing online and, and seeing the writing, I was like, he's a solid writer. You've written what three books? You've you've got three, three yeah. books. Working and on the fourth now. Awesome. And so you, there's this convergence of all these different things. What was this trajectory? Because you said you didn't really have an interest of going into comedy, but then you did. And then things started moving up. You're, you're making all these appearances. You're doing festivals. You're on shows like At Midnight or Smoking Gun. And then also acting in things like Kimmy Schmidt. Like what, how did that come about? You know, I think just... One thing leading to another. I mean, yeah. I, if I can complain some more, all, everything you're saying is like, it's not enough. <laughs> you know, my, I complain. I would love, love to act like four times as much as I do, I feel. Mm -hmm. I, got to do, I get to be in a few handful of things a year. Would love to do more. But, you know, I think it's just performing and then I got an agent and then started to get auditions. But also a big part of it is you know, basically friends doing things, which is not to say like I'm, I'm, you know, I usually have to audition for stuff no matter what, but friends who are working on shows will recommend me as they go, this we, Dave should audition for, to be this pervert or whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. Yeah, you, your credit on Kimmy Schmidt is creep and you're in creep, three episodes yeah. as creep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was like, I always say this is, you know, because I, you know, and then, then the movie Drunk Butts, which came out like a year ago, I play like a weed dealing, Devo obsessed eBay or guy. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I usually play, get roles of like some, it's the only thing where my low self-esteem really pays off, I think, is when. <laughs> The breakdown comes through and it's like, oh, this guy's a sex offender. He's, you know, a low, low level drug dealer, whatever. I'm always like, almost always book those. I'm always like, yeah, I totally got that. <laughs> when I don't book it, I'm surprised, honestly. But I usually do. If, if the person is like some sort of loser of some sort, I'm usually uh, all over it. <laughs> <laughs> You, you have this way of you're chill, low key, but then you're saying things sometimes like in your act, you'll like you kind of did earlier, like I'm the best guitar player. Like there's also that coming through, but it's being presented in this chill, laid back. I don't even know if I'm being serious sort of <laughs> vibe. And it, it all works for itself. So it makes me wonder how your voice developed with comedy. Was that something that you had at the beginning or is that something you started noticing and incorporating over time? Oh, you mean like being like uh, delusional and confident? I guess? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of like <laughs> there are a few things, a few things going on there that seem contradictory, but the, do you pick up on all of them? Like the last show I saw you at, you were talking about turning all the women on, but you're yeah. saying it with the same tone of voice that you have speaking to me. So it, <laughs> it comes across like, like you're almost like, I don't believe, I don't know if I can really do this, but you're saying you're the best at it. You know, it's, it's just a funny juxtaposition. Yeah. I think like, I don't know, you know, if I had to, I don't know, but it's always, I think it's, there's, you know, someone like Chris Elliott, who, mm. you know, I I think growing up, you know, watching him on Letterman in the 80s, like he always played like this 
overly confident moron. And, you know, there's other people that have sort of done not what he did, but or not what he does still. But, uh, you know, that's always kind of a funny thing. I think people, I think that, you know, pe being, people being overly confident or people being overly serious about something is to me are those are two of the funniest things <laughs> so yeah. i think i just kind of do that and then i think there's also i sort of realized early on with performing you know i i think i'm uncomfortable in many ways with the idea of performing I, you know part of me hates the idea of performing i like it when it's happening and i know that so it's why i keep doing it i'm like i know i'll be glad when it's happening yeah you know i'm 99.9 percent .9 of the time enjoy it you know i could count on one hand times when i've been like oh get me out of here <laughs> but uh and i but i but i think even like in promoting myself early on i just was uncomfortable with it and i and like people, I don't know, like you get, people don't send emails out that much anymore to promote people. I think people use social media more, but when people would like, come on out, like, this is a really funny show. I was always like, why are you telling me it's funny? Like, I'll decide if it's funny. So like, I've never said I was, I don't think I've ever said I was funny ever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh called myself a genius many times but never said i was funny <laughs> but so i don't know i just i think uncomfortable with presenting myself whether it be promoting myself or even walking on stage so i thought this is all so absurd anyway like why not make it part of the joke to that i think i'm the best you know, and, and that like everyone loves me and, you know, so I, I don't know, it's sort of, I don't, I think it's just kind of dealing with my insecurity of being a performer and being in front of people. Cause there's a big part of me that, that all of that is the absolute last thing I want to do is put myself out there in any, any way, you know? Right. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> I never said you were funny, but you've called yourself a genius many times. <laughs> well you know i feel i find like i don't know being funniest i mean it's so subjective obviously you know <laughs> and there's so much stuff that like i don't find i i know it's i'm just sound like i'm shitting on the I, very idea of comedy <laughs> but there's like so much like that i don't find funny but I might go like, I don't think that's funny, but I get why other people think it's funny. Uh -huh. And I get why this is massively successful, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. so I can recognize stuff being funny without me being into it myself, you know, in the same way that I get why someone wants, you know, like my girlfriend likes peach snapple. And I don't like peach snapple, but I get why she likes it. I, that's not really a very good analogy, but I'm like, I don't want to ever drink it, but I get why she likes it. I totally get it. No, I totally get that. Cause there are plenty of times where there's a musical artist that I'm just not into and yeah. you know, they might be big and I'll say, well, I, I can appreciate them. I get why they're big. Mm -hmm. I don't want to buy their music. <laughs> I don't want to see yeah. them live but I appreciate them. Yeah. And they, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know. Now we're going down this whole uh, wormhole with music where <laughs> there's the thing like, Oh, I like this really obscure thing. And then I, in my <laughs> mind, they should be playing stadiums. But then when they do play stadiums, you're like, well, fuck them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, what like, is that? When I remember when uh, Death Cab for Cutie signed on to a major label and all these people got mad and it was sort of like, so they're going to be able to take care of themselves now? <laughs> like they yeah, they have a makes, more so solid job in an industry that it's famously hard to have a solid job in and people are mad? Their, their supposed fans are yeah, mad? 
It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, especially when that happens in music and then, you know, the, the person complaining about it is, you know, quote unquote, sold out from day one because they're doing it from their cubicle at <laughs> Enterprise Rent-A-Car or whatever, <laughs> you know, no offense to anyone working in the rental industry. Right. But I mean, it's just like people hold, I don't know, I'm just telling you what you already know. It's like people <laughs> hold artists up to these standards that no one can really... <laughs> Right. Conceivably, like, do you still want music from them? Well, they have to have more success to do that. Yeah. Like, that's just how it works. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that you have on with your online presence is the, hey, it's Dave from before, which I mentioned earlier. How did that line come to you? Like, where, where did the idea to do it that way come to you? I don't know. That's something I've just sort of said, like, like on you know, whatever podcast I might be doing, but, you know, my own th changes all the time, but just the idea that, you know, Dave from before or Dave Hill mentioned earlier or whatever, I started saying it I, probably on my, uh, I had a radio show on WFMU and I think I used to say it then. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't know, it's not like a thing where I was like, oh, this is my thing. I think I started saying it like on the Instagram videos and TikTok, like um, just saying, I don't know, it's just stupid to be like, I'm the guy, you know, you watch it, whatever, like, like they would forget, like they're on your Instagram page, like they're not going to remember. <laughs> I don't know. Now I'm sort of analyzing it, but I, don't <laughs> I know. think it's hilarious. I started I, I, saying I, it. People said, people kept mentioning that I was saying it. So, it sort of became a thing, but also maybe if I'm really going to over, over, over analyze it, I do have this uh, insecurity of being completely unmemorable <laughs> to where I always think like people in coffee shops that I go, I learned this like in my, I've been in this, I've been living in the West Village for like, Oh, oh, 15 more years at least now. Mm -hmm. And I would go into the same coffee shop every day. And like after two years, one of the people working there were like large black coffee. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know? And they're like, cause you come here every day <laughs> and you order the same thing every day. <laughs> and I was like, you remember me? And they're like, yeah, you come here every day. And, but it's my feeble mind, you know, I just kind of assume that, oh, like a million people are coming in here. Why would you remember me? Like, and then I, then I realized like, oh, the people at the bar remember me too. And the <laughs> then I sort of go like, oh, people like, <laughs> and then once I realized that people remember me, then I started to like become friendly with the people at the restaurants and bars and things. Cause I was like, Oh, they don't forget me every time <laughs> I leave. But I think part of me always thinks like, what, why would you remember this bland looking person? So maybe uh, if I can completely overanalyze it. Maybe it comes from that. <laughs> That's funny though. It's such a funny bit because it, it almost, it, when I, when I see it, it almost makes me think, oh, from before, was there something from before that I missed before I knew who you were? You know, like it <laughs> makes me go like, oh, is it, oh, what did I miss? I need to go, do I need to go back and look for something? Yeah, man, maybe it works in that way too. I don't know. <laughs> so you mentioned the radio program that you had on WFMU. Also a podcast. You have a podcast called Dave Hill's Podcasting Incident. Well, now it's now it's called the Dave Hill Good Time Hour. This is a problem with oh. branding. The name changes like every two weeks. <laughs> well, but you've been doing that. You've been podcasting since 2010. Very early adopter of podcasting. Yeah. yeah and you had the that. also the radio show, which is pretty cool. And you were doing that in starting in 2014. Um, but you, you since moved on from that, correct? Yeah, I stopped that, I think in, uh, 
2019, I stopped doing it. Yeah, I just, uh, it was fun to do. And then I was on a book deadline and it was just kind of, I needed to carve out a little time in my calendar. And then as soon as I did, I was like, oh my gosh, why was I doing that radio show? Like once I had the time back and the energy back, I was just like, oh my. So when I stopped it, I didn't, you know, my intention wasn't just to end it, but once I had the time back, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So then I went back to podcasting and that's that. (laughs) How did you get into, like, what made you want to get into doing radio and podcasting? The podcasting, I don't know, it seemed like, you know, not a good answer, but I just, people were doing it. And I remember whatever year it was, I was, you know, Tignataro's house. And I was like, hey, do you want to be on my podcast? And I didn't have one. I just (laughs) turned on my laptop and we started talking and that was it. That was the first episode, you know? So that's how it started is just hanging out at her house a long time ago. And then the radio show, you know, I had been a guest on WFMU shows, you know, the best show when, when that was on and then seven second delay and whatever, you know, I was on a few shows mm-hmm. there. And then the Tom Sharpling's the best show. He ended up leaving WFMU and the time slot was open. And I think that they wanted to replace it with another comedy call in kind of show. So they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I thought, I'm, I mean, I'm always into trying things, you know, so people I'm probably to a fault, which is why I'm kind of like my career is so scattered and, you know, doing different things is if something sounds fun, I'll do it. You know, like if you were like, let's form a triangle (laughs) band, well, I'll play triangles. I'd probably like, Oh, that's interesting. Let's try that. And uh, (laughs) so yeah, if, if something sounds fun, I'll do it. You know, you know, in this day and age, it's not scattered. You know, that's a, I mean, that seems like such a normal thing now. You have people like Steve Harvey doing all the shows, like game shows. I mean, that's just a common thing now is for, for people to have all these different, they're, they're writing books, they're doing public speaking engagements, they have a podcast, and they still do the things they started with, which is comedy and acting. You know, it's, that's yeah. all commonplace now, and you were way ahead of the curve i think oh thanks i mean i don't know yeah i don't yeah people do but the big difference between me and you know steve harvey and whoever else is they have so much money (laughs) i want where's the money i want the money i don't even want that much just a little more you need a tequila brand I, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, work for Sammy Hagar. Um, you know, maybe that's the secret. That is true. Like, not to go off on a, but Sammy Hagar supposedly made more selling tequila and then selling his brand of tequila than he ever did with Van Halen. George Clooney, I think, same thing, yeah. made yeah. tons of money. Yeah. Yeah. From that. And, you know, imagine Ryan Reynolds is doing all right with his gin. With his gin and The Rock is doing well with his tequila. I mean, it's. The Rock has a tequila? The, yeah. Yeah. And it opened really huge, apparently. It launched really huge. Like, it's I it's a thing so. now. There's so many people who are doing that. Because I was looking to see. I, I knew those people, but I was wondering who else had a liquor brand. I knew that Justin Timberlake was with tequila and. um Puff Daddy has Chirac, and so I knew about those. Yeah. But apparently, Willie Nelson has a has a bourbon, and all these people have things. Yeah, I mean there there are a lot of them. Like Metallica, I think has like a whiskey of some sort. I oh, think wow. Bob Dylan does. Iron Maiden has a bunch of different beers, which are actually really good. Yeah, I would I would do it. Like I don't I think I but this you know. To the point of my misguided career, like I would want to do like 
an Amaro or something, like something mm. right mm -hmm. there. I've already blown it because <laughs> it's like not, you know, it's like already no one drinks Amaro, but I like it. Um, I actually made my own. I somehow got into my head. I was like, I bet you could just make this stuff. <laughs> and like you can make it at your house because Amaro, you know, have you, do you know Amaro? Have you had it? I, I know it's a liqueur, right? Yeah, it's like an after dinner drink, like a digestive or whatever. But mm -hmm. it's basically like someone swept up their driveway, you know, and like put <laughs> a bunch of grain alcohol in it. Like there's all these different. So I looked it up and like that was like its origin, not the driveway thing, but basically like people in Italy, like making this stuff at their house. So I looked it up and of course, you know, I found, just found like some other guy in New York who had already done it. And then I just <laughs> went and got the uh, ingredients and I still have this like giant Mason jar. It's like a gallon's worth of Amaro. It's pretty good. It's a bit intense. And I have to bottle it and just give it to friends. Though I'm, I've been reluctant because I'm afraid it might kill somebody. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it really will, but I feel like it might. <laughs> but I haven't well, there's, done it. There's, some, there's something you can get in with that and, and brand hilariously. I, I, I believe in that. I believe you I would, can. You know, but I think you're right, yeah. I have my, my friend Dave Ketching, who has played in like, Queens of the Stone Age and Eagles of Death Metal. He he mm -hmm. he is like out in Joshua Tree and has his own brand of mezcal that he does with a friend. Mm -hmm. And I'm really jealous. And it's delicious too. Wow. And uh, so like that's like an actual easy guy to mess that up. I know. What's <laughs> yeah. that? I feel like mezcal is easy to mess up. Yeah, this stuff is really good. It's called Rancho de la Luna after his studio. I'm not, I realize I've shifted into doing a commercial for it, but <laughs> it's really good. No, but all these people and I just did a show at uh, Maynard Keenan from Tool and his wife, mm -hmm. Jen, have uh, they have like a winery and vineyard and all that. And they have a whole empire doing that. So I think you're right. That's the next move. Do it. Do something. Uh, with, I know. With, uh, I love them. You're, I want a side hustle. But yeah, you, you've got so many avenues. Just add one where people are drinking. <laughs> I know. No, yeah, this is good. <laughs> I love it. I want to talk a little bit more about the acting work you've done because you've been on things like Inside Amy Schumer. And I mentioned earlier, you did Kimmy Schmidt. You also did a thing on Bull Frontal and uh, Jim Gaffigan show. So there are a ton of things, Modern Family as well. Actually, you, between oh, you and me, I've never been on Modern Family. It's some IMDB screw up that I've not oh. bothered to correct because I figured it only helps me to have, even though should probably just edit this out because this I'm screwing it up for myself. But <laughs> I think it probably looks good that I was on Modern Family, but I wasn't. <laughs> I don't know. I think they maybe someone else Nate with my name was on yeah. it or or something. I don't know. Well, but, uh, those acting the, roles that you got, I, I know you mentioned earlier that sometimes it was a friend suggesting you and stuff. What was that experience like going going into that? Because now it's it's scripted. It's not like live shows, you know, it's, it's something, it's a whole new world. It seems from doing a lot of the stuff you were doing before. So what was that transition like? And, and what were some good experiences you had with that? Um, it's fun to do, you know, I, you know, it's same thing. I, you know, I didn't grow up being in plays and things like that. I always say like, I'm a wild wild horse when it comes to acting i don't really know i have little techniques that i've that i've learned that i try to incorporate but i really like it and would like to do more of it i think actually when i did the i think kimmy schmidt the first steps so that i did and then after that i starred in a movie and so it's kind of a nice rhythm right off of, you know all did one after another and doing a whole movie i really learned 
a lot. I did this movie boy band with Steve Agee and Seth Herzog and Jordan Carlos and some other fine folks. And uh, I really learned a lot. I mean, it wasn't Citizen Kane or anything. Mm. Though people really, you know, I recommend people watch it. And it's a really Mm. funny movie. But it was like, I learned so much doing it because I was in the whole movie. And like, (laughs) and I had to go, I was like, oh, like, you know, after two days of shooting, I was like, oh, now I get like who this guy is. And like, he has like an arc in this movie. And then I wanted to like go back and reshoot the first two days of the movie. But then it it was like exciting. For, it was like, a you know, something I'm sure like a lot of people realize when they're like five years old. But I didn't realize it until, you know, older. But I was, it, I got really excited making that movie because it was the first time I was in like every scene or most of the scenes. Mm-hmm. So I had to be like, oh yeah, so now this guy is, this has happened. So this guy, he must feel this way and this and that, you know, <laughs> kind of like things that, you know, I realize should be obvious, but I'm a simple man and it just took me a while. <laughs> so I think and that was a handful of years ago. Uh, but I think since then, I've just been really excited about it and like just want to do more. And I've been able to do more, but I'm like, come on, I want more. So if anyone's listening and can put me in a whole movie, um, please do. Yeah, because it, it's just, it's fun. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to do it to the point where I become a monster or anything like that, you know. Oh, right. But just, you know, it's fun to do. And uh, yeah, there's usually great snacks. <laughs> um, so I like that. And I like jobs where you can nap for long <laughs> yeah. stretches. Yeah. So sometimes you just go back to your trailer and you can nap for like two hours. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people talk eight. about how like it, it could be 14 hour day shoots and stuff, but like there's a lot of downtime. <laughs> so yeah, depending on, you know, I'm guessing Tom Cruise stays busy the whole, we can only, we hope, we assume he's busy the whole time, but. <laughs> he's learning how to fly but, another plane, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But a guy like me, I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a great chat. It's now time to create something together. Okay. And I would really like to hear process that we could maybe talk through of creating comedy or even a TikTok or, or whatever from this perspective of, I just want to make myself laugh. I just want to be silly. Cause I feel like there's so many comedy creators now who are thinking about that process from, okay, it's gotta be just so it's gotta be like this. And, and what's the way they can break free of that and just have fun and be silly and, and try to make their friend la- laugh, but it still be quality. I think it's just, you know, this isn't anything I've come up with, but I think, I think, well, ironically, I think thinking is like, should be avoided as much as possible. Um, because I mean, you can take something and refine it, but I, you know, they, what people say, first thought, best thought. And Mm -hmm. I think that is usually pretty true Mm -hmm. unless you're really drunk then it's the opposite (laughs) but i but i think uh yeah the best stuff comes of just doing it and letting stuff out and you know i would say even you know with music any success i've had with music has always been that same Mm. thing you know I, i can't not that i've you know i'm some massively successful musician either but you know things where you know like one I, I wrote a song that ended up being the theme to the john oliver show right and like that i still have it on my phone you know i i just woke up at like four in the morning i was really jet lagged because i just gotten back from japan and i had this melody in my head and i just hummed it into my phone and then I just woke up and made a demo of it. And mm-hmm. the final song is pretty much what I hummed into my phone. You know, I added some words and things like that, but I don't think I could have slaved over 
something and come up with something that was had just sort of the same quality to it. It was more just spontaneous and fun. How did it end when it ends up as the theme song for that show? How did that happen? Was it something that you had put out and then they found it and then asked? Yeah, them to it, it had already come out. We had made the record and, um, you know, I knew John through comedy and friends with Liz Stanton, the showrunner yeah. over there. And had worked with her before. And I, I, I've never, I'd never asked them like how it came about really. Maybe someday I will. But I think I'm guessing they were like, I don't know, let's see. We need a theme song. Let's see what Dave's been up to. <laughs> um, because we had, you know, the record came out. And then I think a short, few months later, she just called me up and was like, hey, we want to use this song. So just really lucky thing. And I'm super grateful for it. And it's a, such a great show. I love the show, you know. We, however you call it, DVR or whatever it's called when you tape a show. I don't know, mm -hmm. even know what the words are now, <laughs> but my girlfriend does this and then she turns it on. And then I am like, oh, that, <laughs> that riff that I wrote at four in the morning because I couldn't sleep is coming out of the TV. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And I wish it, I wish I, it happened a bunch more. I, I, every, <laughs> the theme of, the theme of this is me complaining that I don't have more of every single thing. <laughs> so it sounds like the your process when you're doing really anything, creating anything is an idea comes to you. You don't overthink it. You put something out and then, you know, it may go through a refining stage, but mm -hmm. you pretty much are what, what ends up is the original idea just in, in like a pure form. Is that, was it, would you say that's accurate? Yeah. I mean, almost anything I can point to that I've had any success with is that that's basically a big part of it is just having fun and not, I don't think I've ever sat down and thought, oh, I want to do something really good. That's going to make me money. Mm -hmm. You know, like I want to, think of some thing that everyone's going to love and it's going to put a bunch of money in my pocket. I'm sure there are plenty of, there are definitely plenty of people who know how to create that way, but I am the opposite. So anything that's ever resonated with anybody that I've ever done, anything that's led to work or money or, uh, you know, anything that's kind of gone done anything has come from just having fun and being an idiot for lack of a better word like <laughs> i mean if you know i it's it's like with i hate to you know i feel like i'm too old to even talk about tiktok and instagram but <laughs> it's the world we live in but and you know the the videos that have you know some of them have one two million views or whatever which, you know, in the, that world, there's plenty of people that get seven bazillion views mm -hmm. or whatever. But for me, that's a lot to get that many. And all any ones that have done that have truly just been like this stupid thing. And then I posted it, not even thinking that anyone would give a shit about it. And then that's <laughs> always the thing. But that anytime I'm like... Anytime I'm like, oh, this is really going to get uh -huh. him, then it's like, <laughs> no one gives a shit about it. That's uh, my experience to a T. I mean, I've not had anything like go like have a million views on anything that I made on TikTok or something. But whenever I've had a tweet blow up, it was always something that I tweeted, forgot about. And when I got back on Twitter and saw I had a lot of notifications, my Every time without fail, my instinct is, oh no, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Are a bunch of people yelling at me right now? And then I click and it's just like, oh, a bunch of people like that. <laughs> so yeah, as much as I claim to hate social media, but also depend on it, uh -huh. uh, it's true. It's, you know, it's a good example of that. Yeah, just kind of like, it's all the same lessons we learn over and over, you know. Don't overthink it. Be yourself, whatever. 
<laughs> yeah. Have a little fun. Yeah, have some fun. And then, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll all work out. Yeah. And if it doesn't, at least you had fun, you know? Because <laughs> it, there's no, it's horrible when you didn't have any fun and it didn't work out. <laughs> you know, yep. that's the worst outcome of all. <laughs> but if you if you have fun and it doesn't work out, at least you have fun. Absolutely. There it is. Thanks so much for being on the podcast, Dave. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was so great having him. I hope you enjoyed that. Dave has three books that you can get. He has Parking the Moose, Dave Hill Doesn't Live Here Anymore, and Tasteful Nudes. He also has a comedy album called Let Me Turn You On and a podcast called Dave Hill's Podcasting Incident. You can find that anywhere you get podcasts. He also has a few shows coming to Boise at the Mad Swede on July 15th and 16th. Go to DaveHillOnline.com for more info on that. Follow him on Facebook at the Dave Hill and on Instagram and TikTok at Mr. Dave Hill. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at There It Is Pod. And follow me on Twitter at Jason Far Jokes and Instagram at Jason Far Picks. Also, subscribe to our Comedy Lifestyle newsletter and support us if you can. We have a Patreon and a PayPal. Go to thereitispod.com for newsletter and support info. Links in bio. Until next time, be good to each other. The music for the theme song was created by Neil Brooks. The rap was written and performed by Nick Acevedo. The logo for There It Is was created by Jeff Prater. The There It Is podcast is produced by Jason Farr. (laughs) 